You know, something happened to me this morning that uh, has never happened to me before. Well, I, I went to go shave, and I found some grays in my beard. I know what that means. I'm getting very wise. The title of our message this morning is actually from a song from the 80s by a band, uh, Motley Crue. You ever heard of them? And the song is called Home Sweet Home. Let me read you some of the lyrics. Just when things went right, it doesn't mean they were always wrong. Just take this song and you'll never feel left all alone. Take me to your heart. Feel me in your bones. Just one more night and I'm coming off this long and winding road. I'm on my way. I'm on my way. Home, sweet home. Tonight, tonight, I'm on my way. I'm on my way. Home, sweet home. You know that I've seen too many romantic dreams up in lights falling off the silver screen. My heart's like an open book for the whole world to read. Sometimes nothing keeps me together at the seams. I'm on my way home, sweet home. You know, we live in a very romanticized world where things are made to seem better than they really are. There are many sermons being preached this morning to make you feel good when maybe you're not doing all that good. There are a lot of messages being spoken through the media to give you this perspective on our world that is completely falsified for publicity. Many people are deceived, and I put before you, in Christendom, it's the same way. People are very deceived. It's not all that different. I've got three points for you this morning. Point number one is, things aren't always what they seem. Point number two is, life won't always gleam. And point number three is, but never lose your dream. Yeah. Things aren't always what they seem. You know, at the beginning of the song, it says, just when things went right, it doesn't mean that they were always wrong. Look over in your Bibles in 1 John chapter 4. Things aren't always what they seem. 1 John chapter 4. We'll start our reading here in verse 12. No one has ever seen God. You know, there's a lot of preachers out there that claim they've seen visions of God. There's a lot of people out there that say they've had dreams where they've seen God. My Bible says no one has ever seen God. But if we love one another... God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him, and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. You see, God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world, we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. You know, right here we see that, that God gives the clear sign of his people. Not to be flashing lights. Not to be their level of prosperity. Not to be like Jesus said, even the miracles can be deceiving. No, the one true sign of God's people and God himself 
is summed up in one word, love. Love will do anything. Love will sacrifice. Love will give it all up. Love will go the distance. Love never quits. And isn't that what God does for us? Therefore, this is what we ought to be doing for one another. I want to show you in the Bible what the first century church looked like. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. You know, it's been 2,000 years since the church existed back in the first century, and therefore a lot has been changed and tainted over those two millennia. But let's read here together the mark of the first century church in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Hold it right there. Now this is amazing. So often we read this passage and we just glance over verse 1. The Bible says they were all together in one place. You know what's preached in our world nowadays is that you don't have to go to church to have a relationship with God. That is completely contrary to the scriptures, whereas the disciples saw it completely necessary to be together for their relationship with God. We'll talk more about that later on. You know, the fact that they were all together is incredible. I was doing a little research, and you know, the Jews had been scattered all over the world several times in the history of, of their people. The first major dispersion of the Jews was back in 586 BC when the Babylonians came into Judah and they took them off into captivity as slaves. So obviously they were dispersed then. People ran for their lives all over the world and then a large selection of them were taken as slaves to Babylon. The second major dispersion was during the reigning of the Greeks and it was called the Syrian dispersion. The third major dispersion was the Egyptian dispersion. And the fourth one was back in B.C. 63. And it was the Roman dispersion when Pompey conquered Jerusalem and then the people scattered. So the fact that they're all together in one place shows the power of God to bring them all back together for the day of Pentecost. Let's continue reading here. Verse 2. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. I mean, the Spirit's really at work right here. You see them all just kind of hanging out, having a good time. And this loud noise, like the sound of a blowing of a violent wind, maybe a hurricane or a tornado. The, the things are blowing around, but they hear the sound of it. Now, back then, you hear a loud noise, you're going to be freaking out. See, back, you know, nowadays we got speakers and we got sound systems. We're, we're, we're used to loud noises. Back then, the loudest noise you could probably think of is maybe a, a baby screaming or, you know, you, you break a, a jar on the floor. Nothing was really loud. So the fact that they're all just kind of hanging out and there's this super loud noise is going to be freaking them out. And then the Bible says that this ball of fire separated. I like to think it exploded because that's cooler right there. So this ball of fire enters the room. You can feel its heat. You're like, what is going on right now? And it explodes and everybody gets fire on their head. You think the spirit was working on this day? This is incredible. And then the Bible very interestingly says right here in verse five that there were Jews from every nation under heaven. You see the heart that God has, not just for Jerusalem, but for all people of all nations. Jump over to verse 9. Well, where were they from? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans, and Arabs. Now right here, you, you see about 15 different places where these people were from. And then the Bible says that these people were all together. So here's something so incredible right here, is that they had all come
come together despite being dispersed over the last several hundred years. Something had drawn them all together. There's power in unity. See, it's one thing if a, if a man stands up and tries to preach a powerful sermon and live a radical life, he may not get a whole lot of followers, well, unless you're Jesus. But when you get a whole crowd of people that believe the same thing, are doing the same thing, live in the same way, preaching the same stuff, there's power in unity. And then what's so incredible about this is these 15 places, you can study out the history, we don't have time to get into it right now, they're all covered in the four major dispersions. God didn't forget about anyone. God had a heart for every single Jew. Well, let's jump down to verse 14. Then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. We're not going to get into it, but right here we see Peter, being the leader of the disciples, stands up to preach a sermon. Well, what does he talk about? Jump down to verse 22. Men of Israel... Listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. The premise of Peter's sermon right here it's very simple. Jesus was a real person. Number two, he died for your sins, and oh yeah, you're guilty of his death. Yes. Now, does that mean that all the Jews personally took a hammer and nail and hung him up on the cross? No, what that means is that they were guilty for the sin that hung him up on the cross. And then number three, God raised him from the dead. All right, let's go down to verse 36. He closes out his sermon with these words. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. You see, a lot of times people think that you can become a Christian and then in time get more and more and more committed. But you see, for the first century church, every single member, whether you were an apostle or a baby Christian, was summed up in one word, they. And the Bible says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, breaking bread, and to prayer. The standard of commitment was the same throughout the entire church. Didn't matter if you're on the front row or the back row. Didn't matter if you serve or you don't have a role yet. Every single person was called to the same standard. No, we see in verse 14, Peter preaches. We see in verse 22 to 24, he says, all the responsible. And then from verse 36 to 42, we see that everyone ought to repent and be baptized. There were no exceptions. You know, I'm, I'm so amazed here by verse 42. Because you see the hearts of the disciples. I mean, Peter warned them and pleaded with them to get saved. He didn't warn them and plead with them to come to church on Sunday. He didn't warn them and, and plead with them to be devoted. You see, someone that loves God and has God's love living in them wants to be a part of that kind of church. You don't have to tell them to do anything. They want to do it. They have a desire to do it. They were devoted. They were addicted to the fellowship. I really believe that that's got to be our hearts. You know, God's church really is composed of all nations. I want, I want to appreciate the moment right here. I mean, just take a second to look around the fellowship. I mean, this is incredible. I wish you were up here to see what I see. I mean, the colors, the ages, 
I mean, this is, this is just phenomenal. I mean, the, the, the attire is beautiful. I mean, this, I like to think this is what the rug of heaven is going to look like right here. Just representing all nations. I want to ask you a question. How can a church fulfill the great commission to go and make disciples of all nations? How can a church evangelize the world if they themselves are not international? I put before you, it is not possible. How does Coke evangelize the world? They're international. They got headquarters all over the world. How do people in the media evangelize the world? Because they're on ESPN in China and America. How in the world are we going to evangelize these people without having international churches? It cannot and it will not be done. I am, I am so grateful to be a part of such an international fellowship of disciples of Jesus Christ. You know, let us, let us not take it for granted what we have here in the fellowship. You know, the, the four major dispersions, these, these were times of oppression, times of slavery. This was a very challenging time for the Jews. And yet God had destined this plan to be the only way at world evangelism. You see, how can people be sent out back home if their home was just in Jerusalem the whole time? God's very plan was to send people out around the world so when the time came, they could go home and evangelize their nations. You know, things aren't always what they seem. A lot of times, hardship seems to hit us square in the face. And it knocks us down. But if we can learn to see it from the eyes of God and the perspective that he has, you will not see it as hardship more than you will see it as an opportunity. You know, God sometimes allows these hardships into our life to train us. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7 through 11, say that if you are trained by these things, you can become a righteous vessel for God. Let's look over in Acts chapter 8, verse 16. Acts 8, verse 16. I'm sorry, chapter 7, verse 50, 53. You know, Stephen right here, Stephen was one of the first disciples to go out on the mission field. And he goes on out and he's preaching the truth. And sometimes not everyone's going to like the truth. And so he's surrounded now by a band of people that want him dead. Look how he closes his sermon here in verse 53. You who have received the law that was put into effect through angels have not obeyed it. Whew. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelled at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees, cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep, and Saul was there, giving approval to his death. You know, right here, we see that this young preacher, Stephen, is out just giving his heart to preach to the people. And they drag him out of the city. Now, back then, if you're going to be stoned, what happened was they would dig these pits out in an open area, and then all the people would stand around the pit. So there was no getting out. There was no escaping. 
So more than likely, they drug, they drug him out to this, this pit. They, they push him down into the bottom of the pit. And he's standing there, fully surrounded by a bunch of people that are gnashing their teeth, holding these rocks, about to hurl them at him. And yet, there is no fear in love. Stephen looks around, and he prays for every single one of them. God, they do not know what they are doing. The Bible says he went down and he fell asleep. I like to think of my son, Brenton, when I think of falling asleep. <laughs> that wasn't my son, but that was cute. <laughs> you see, when, when my son falls asleep, it is the most beautiful thing. There is a, a, a peace. There is a, there is a comfort. There is, there is a confidence when, when he goes to sleep. He just kind of drifts into a nice, deep sleep. I like to think that before the, the stones were hurled at Stephen, that when the Bible says he fell asleep, I like to think he got down on his knees. He said that prayer, and the Lord ended his life in a peaceful way before he ever felt the pain of those stones. You see, and then right here, it says that Saul was there giving approval to his death. I bet you Saul would never forget this moment. You know, in 2 Timothy, Saul, later named in chapter 13, Paul, he writes 2 Timothy to Timothy at the end of his life around 67 AD, and he says, just behold, there is a crown of life just waiting for you. Well, guess what the word crown in the Greek is? Stephanos. Another word for Stephen. I put before you at the end of Saul's life, he remembered watching that very first Christian give his life for his faith. And therefore, when he was laid down and the chopper was coming for his neck, he could go in peace knowing he would join Stephen in heaven one day. You know... Many of us view death as a very sad time. And very often it is because we miss the people we love when they pass away. But look what happens to the disciples after the death of Stephen. Let's continue reading. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close, close attention to what he said. With streaks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. You know, right here you see that the heart of the disciples, when their brother Stephen was killed, was not a, a, a fear, was not a, a running for their life. No, a perfect love drives out fear. But it was a very planned scattering. The apostles stayed there in Jerusalem, and they sent out the disciples around the world. Well, how do we know that they were not afraid? Right here it says in verse 4, they preached the word wherever they went. If you run in fear, you're not going to continue preaching the word. So these guys run away, and they are just fired up about going home to their friends and their families scattered around the world so they can now, too, bring the gospel to the Gentiles. You know, many missionaries fail on the mission field because they fail to establish churches where people that are converted can come be a part of. And therefore, they spend thousands of dollars, several months on end, to go and spend time with people, to love up on them, to, to heal them, and all of that is good. All of that is good. But when you don't establish a church where they can all come now fellowship and worship together, then you're only feeding them to the wolves. You're, you may save a few, but, but their salvation will be in question once Satan starts to get on the attack. There has to be an international discipling church somewhere where they can go and have comfort and have peace. You guys with me here? 
You know, I, I really want to lift up uh, our brother James Pack right here. James grew up in Southern California in a very Korean home. <laughs> I say very Korean because he was really the only one in his family that, that knew English. No one else really could speak any English. And so when James was at home, he had a hard time communicating because he's learning English at school and he can't use his Korean at school. And when he's at home, he can't use his English with his family. He can only try to speak Korean. So, so James would have a very challenging time communicating with people. And at a certain point, he decided just to cut off all communication and he was just going to stop talking to people altogether. James went many years without having full-on conversations with people around him, even with family members. And then something miraculous happened to him. Back in 2012, James was reached out to on his college campus at Cal State Fullerton. And James came on out to a devotional. And when you're around disciples, you're kind of forced into conversation. And he started having these conversations with people. And before you know it, he started learning, hey, I'm, I can communicate. I'm, I'm, I'm not all that bad. So he, he gets around the brothers. He starts studying the Bible and very courageously gets baptized as a true disciple of Jesus Christ. And yet, there was still an obstacle. He wasn't fluent in Korean. And so he wasn't yet able to go and save his family. So he comes out here to Syracuse. And he spends two years in Syracuse getting really good at English. And after two years of being here in Syracuse, just this past August, he had the opportunity to go back home to be with his family back in Southern California. And while he was there, he used the little Korean that he knows and invited his mom out to church. So his mom comes out to church for the very first time and she is blown away. She feels the love seeping through the seams of the room and all the women are hugging her and talking to her and, and trying to get her phone number and, and just, just become friends. Her mom gives her number out to, his mom gives her number out to a, a few of the, the, the women there. The women start getting in touch, but come to find out, nobody speaks Korean. So they're literally calling our sister churches all over the world, looking for someone that knows Korean. They found two, one of them being in Hawaii. And so there wasn't anybody in the Los Angeles area that was going to be able to study the Bible with his mom. So James took it upon himself and he said, I am going to become fluent in Korean. And James got a new conviction. He said, I'm going to become fluent in Korean because not only do I want to save my family, but I want to start saving Koreans all over the world. James now has a heart to reach out to Koreans in Korean and help them become true disciples. Isn't that awesome? You know, you, you cannot reach out to somebody if you do not speak their language. So how can a non-international non church evangelize the whole world if they're only speaking one language? We've got to make sure that we have the heart that we need to have for all people of all nations. Amen? Amen. Let's go to point number two. Life won't always gleam. Right here in the song, it says, just one more night, and I'm coming off this long and winding road. You ever end your day like that? You get home, and you're like, oh my gosh, what a day that was. A long and winding day. And you get to your room, and you see your pillow, and it just starts glowing. You're like, oh baby, I am going to sleep good tonight. You go on over and you're out in an instant. You know what I'm talking about? Don't you just love those nights? I mean, we don't like those nights where we're tossing and we're turning and it's hot and can't fall asleep. No, we just, we, we love those long and winding days. So when it's time to wind down, we just fall right asleep. You know, Life won't always gleam. Sometimes we want this, this, this road to heaven that's just going to be kind of straight and regular and no turns. We just want it to be nice and easy and simple. Lord, just get me there quickly. You know what I'm talking about? And God says, 
Let's take you for a little detour over here. Let's go back this way over. Let's go up. Let's go down. Let's go right back. You just start feeling it. You're like, oh God, what is going on? This isn't what I prayed about. I thought when I got, got saved and became a Christian, I thought this was going to be easy peasy. Oh God, I just I can't do it anymore. Life won't always gleam. You know, sometimes we wonder why things are scattered and dispersed. And sometimes we're so busy that we get overwhelmed. And sometimes we're so underwhelmed, we get overwhelmed that we don't have more to going on in life. You know, we start, we start wondering how come things are going differently. You know, our, our dreams are scattered. Our, our job just kind of isn't making a whole lot of sense. We're not getting paid the money we need to, to, to pay our bills. You know, Stephen had to die in order for the world to get evangelized. There had to be hardship for there to be good news. Good news always starts with bad news. You ever heard that song? If you're going through hell, keep on going, don't slow down. I'm just going to stop right there. Sometimes it's, it's challenging. It's hard. But God says, just, just keep on going. You're, if you're going through hell, just keep on going. It's almost over. It's almost over. You know, this all started with the death of Stephen. A lot of times, death brings us to reality. And we see death a lot in the media nowadays, don't we? It's sad what's going on in Chicago. All the shootings. It's sad to hear the, the shootings all over the country. I mean, there is constant violence in the world that we live in. I'm just kind of waiting for, for God to, to send a massive earthquake to just kill everybody. Because that's, that's what he did back in the day. There was so much violence. God, God was, was just saddened that, that, he, that he made everybody. He says, forget it. I'm just going to send the flood. We're going to start over. You know, sometimes I'm watching, the, I'm watching the news. I'm like, this doesn't look like it's getting any better. It doesn't look like people are, 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 are getting a clue here. I mean, it just gets worse and worse. You know, one of the things that, that's huge in the media nowadays is all the prejudice of America, all the racism in America. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, these people hate these people, and these people hate these people, and these people hate these people for hating these people. And, and there's, constant, there's constant prejudices. And as Christians, it doesn't always mean that our, our prejudices totally go away. And sometimes we've got to suppress those feelings that we have and repent of those sins too. Not to look down on anybody, but to love everyone equally. Look back in 1 John chapter 4. I want to address the issue of prejudice. 1 John chapter 4, verse 13, John writes... We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. You know, John writes 1 John around 95 AD towards the end of his life. I put before you, he did not make up this really cool term, the savior of the world. It's incredibly accurate, but John did not make it up. He, he's, he's not that awesome. Let's see where he got it from. The, the term Savior of the world is only found one other time in the entire Bible. Let's go to John chapter 4. You know, in John chapter 4, John cites that Jesus had been walking along this road and that Jesus had reached out to this Samaritan woman. And in verse 13... The Bible reads, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of living water welling up to eternal life. You know, this incredible Jesus wants to give the Samaritan woman this well, this everlasting spring of living water. Well, who is this woman? Look up in verse 9. This was a Samaritan woman. And she says, 
You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. You know, this is the only other time in the Bible where we see the savior of the world term being used. Look down to verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Where did John get this phrase from back in 95 AD? He got it from the time when he was walking with Jesus. And Jesus reached out to a Samaritan woman. And a Samaritan woman reached out to her Samaritan friends. And all of them came to the conviction that Jesus was the Savior of the world. I think John heard this and he told himself, I am never going to forget that. And we see 65 years later, he writes about it in 1 John chapter 4, 14. You know, the Jews had an intense hatred. They did not want to associate with the Samaritans. There was a prejudice there. They wouldn't even associate. I mean, that's not the standard of Jesus. The standard of Jesus is to love. They wouldn't even associate with the Samaritans. Well, why not? See, back in the day, 722 BC, the Assyrians came into Israel and they took them off into captivity. When the Jews came back, so did many of these, what they call hybrids, of the Assyrians that had been with the Jews who now became the Samaritans. So the Jews saw the Samaritans as quote unquote half breeds. They were not fully Jewish and they were not fully Gentile. They were disgustingly somewhere in the middle. And for many Jews, they, they did not want anything to do. So the fact that Jesus here is reaching out and then he offers her the living water. And then he even uses his miraculous powers on her. Just blew the minds of the disciples. They're like, wait, hold up. Jesus, you're a Jew and she's a Samaritan. What are you doing? You know, many people nowadays have that same hatred and prejudice toward another kind of person. You know, life is this long and winding road. Sometimes we've got to be sure in our hearts that we don't look down on anyone. But just like Jesus, we give everybody an equal, perfect love. You guys with me? If there is a prejudice, if there is a temptation to look down on, on anyone from another place or anyone of, a, of another nation or another culture, you must be very careful. Because the Bible says that love inside of you must be given equally. And we are not to show favoritism with it. Now, I'm very excited for after church today. We're going to have a potluck lunch. And we're going to taste all kinds of food from all over the place. Now, I hope that none of us are going to eat this food and go, ew. <laughs> we, need to, we need to appreciate the differences of an international church. Amen? Amen? Let's go to our third point. Never lose the dream. Right here at the end of the song. Too many romantic dreams end up in lights, falling off the silver screen. One of the definitions of romantic is suggesting an idealized view of reality. You know, for us guys, the Bible is real, amen? And the Bible is the ideal, amen? And the Bible is the standard. So if the Bible is real, and the Bible is the ideal, and the Bible is the standard, then the ideal is the standard. If we lived in a perfect world, well, we'd have a perfect world. <laughs> there would be no hate, only love. There would be no war, only peace. There would be no divide, only unity. There would be no mediocrity, only excellence. There would be no sin, 
only righteousness. Therefore, this is what we must expect because this is the standard of the scriptures. I've got to ask you a question. Have you become numb to the state of the world we live in? Do you accept mediocrity? Do you accept divide? Do you accept hatred and war? Do you accept these different things, the sin that so easily prevails? Do you just accept them? Or do you hold up the Bible as the standard, the ideal, and command all people to live by the word of God? You know, we've got to make sure in our hearts, we don't look down on anyone, but there absolutely is a standard that everyone will be judged by. And that standard is the word of God. Look over in Romans chapter 10. If you are numb, I put before you, it's because the Bible is not your standard. Romans chapter 10, verse 1. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. So right here we see Paul is about to address the Israelite Christians, the Jewish Christians. Jump down to verse 8. What does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You know, right here, we've got to ask ourselves, who is you? Because in verse 9 and 10, it refers to you 10 times. So who is you? Well, it's simple. Look up in verse 1. It's the brethren. It's the Jewish Christians. Well, how do you know they were Christians? Because chapter 1, verse 7 says that the entire letter of the Romans was written to the Roman Christians, those loved by God, called to be saints. So right here we see that God is not talking to everybody. He's talking very specifically to the audience of the Jewish Christians. And he says, listen, guys, if you do these things, yes, you'll be saved. But he's not teaching them how to be saved. They were already saved. So what's his point? Verse 11. Anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What is the whole point right here? The whole point is very simply that Paul wants the Jewish Christians to understand salvation is not just for the Jews. Salvation is for anyone and everyone who accepts Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Look over in chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, verse 12. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not those who hear the law that are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. Since they show that the requirements of law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witnesses and their thoughts now accusing, even now defending them. This will take place on the day when God will judge men's secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. You know, what Paul's saying right here is, listen, if you're trying to live up to the law, you'll never be able to do it. I mean, raise your hand if you perfectly lived up to the Bible, the, the law of God this last week. Come on, nobody? Not even one. That's the point. He says nobody can live up to the law. Nobody can do this. So then he goes into the Gentiles, because we all know that the Gentiles are not Jewish. They have no law. They don't have the Bible. They're very pagan. And so then he lays out the standard for the Gentiles. He says, okay, if you don't have the law, then you have your conscience. Now raise your hand if you have a conscience. 
That's all of us. And he says, listen, if you can live up to your conscience perfectly, you will go to heaven. Now raise your hand if you perfectly lived up to your conscience this past week. And that's the point. He says, there is a law, and it is the standard, but nobody can live up to it. And then there is the conscience, and it is the standard, but nobody can live up to it. So what does it say? Everybody's going to perish. Nobody can be perfect. There is no way. He says, only by the grace of God can we be saved. You see, in Romans chapter 6, he goes on to talking about baptism. And he says that your baptism is a literal participation with Jesus in his death, burial, and resurrection. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 to 25, say that all men sin and fall short of the glory of God. So therefore, everybody needs the blood of Jesus. And then we get into Romans chapter 10, where Paul is reminding them of their salvation and trying to help them see salvation is for everyone. It's for all nations. You know, it's very exciting to, uh, to know that Syracuse has personally touched different places around the world. Uh, just a few months ago, we, uh, we got back our dear sister, Oksana, and uh, she did a great job sharing for communion. Thank you so much, sis. Um, Oksana didn't share, but while she was in Russia, she had the opportunity to study the Bible with a young girl who never decided to become a Christian, but just this past week decided she did want to become a Christian, and she got right with God. And so Oksana's kind of been fruitful, even from Syracuse over there in Russia. Isn't that awesome? Now the church in Moscow is approaching 100 disciples strong. You know, in 2006, the Syracuse Church sent over $100,000 and a mission team of about 20 people out to Chicago to plant a new church in Chicago. And when they got there, uh, it started growing, it started doing great things, but a young woman was reached out to by the name of Nikki DeBaris. She's now Nikki Williams. But she's a Filipino girl, and so she has a lot of influence over other Filipinos on her campus. Well, she reaches out to another young woman named Charmaine. Charmaine's Filipino, she becomes a Christian, and Charmaine had the opportunity to start studying the Bible and reaching out to all of her friends. She calls up a guy named Johnny over there in California, and she goes, Johnny, listen, I'm in this church in, in Chicago. It's incredible. You got to go check out the sister church in California. So Johnny, being in Southern California, goes to check out the church in California. He starts studying the Bible, and he becomes a Christian. Amen. Now, just this past few months, we actually had the opportunity to plant a church in the Manila, Philippines. And on that mission team was Johnny, the son in the faith to Charmaine, the daughter in the faith to Nikki, and my daughter in the faith. Isn't that awesome? And so we got to see how Syracuse got to touch an international congregation. And just this past week on Facebook, Johnny baptized one of his new friends over there in the Philippines. Isn't that awesome? Now the church in Manila is over 100 disciples. They're doing awesome things for God in just the last 10 weeks. I want to share with you some very exciting news. You know, Syracuse over the years has given millions of dollars, and I'm not exaggerating. Syracuse has given millions of dollars and it has always given some of its top leadership to go help plant and strengthen other churches around the world. Is that not the truth? Yeah. I mean, can you think about where the church would be at if we had retained all of our money and all of our people? I mean, the size the congregation would be now, I guarantee you we wouldn't be meeting in a gymnasium with no air conditioning. <laughs> but you know, that's not what we're all about. Like what Rob was saying earlier, we're, we're all about people and investing in people. So very excitingly, um, moving here in just a month is another ministry couple. They're full time and they got three kids and that couple is Anthony and Maria Franklin from Chicago. Now Anthony is a phenomenal preacher. In fact, when I moved to Chicago in 2006, he was my very first mentor there. And he was the one that inspired me to want to become a minister someday. So Anthony to me has just always been a hero in the faith. Anthony is also a very talented song leader. He knows all the songs in the song book. Isn't that awesome? And Maria is a great mom. She's got two teenagers and a one-year-old, Nathan. And you know, it's incredible to know that this is quite the opportunity for the Syracuse Church. Never in the history of Syracuse have we seen two full-time couples leading at the same time. 
We've had people, we've had interns, but never two full-time ministry couples. I'm very excited about this because, number one, my wife is super encouraged. Courtney's, Courtney's been praying for someone to move here that has a baby just like her. But also, I'm very close with Anthony. And I'm very excited to, to let you know that Anthony and Maria are the future of the Syracuse church. Now, we told a couple people this last week that we were going to be receiving them. And the first question out of many people's mouths were, well, where are you going? I said, no, no, no. That's the exciting thing about it. We all get to stay. We're all staying. The plan is that whenever the Lord calls Courtney and I off to another city, it could be a year from now, it could be tomorrow, it could be 10 years from now. But whenever we get called to go, Anthony and Maria will raise up and they will be the future leaders of the Syracuse church. They'll be here by October 1st. I encourage you to wrap your arms around them. Amen? Now, I do need to say this. Anthony and Maria have three kids. And I'm, I'm very uh, encouraged. I think our interns here in Syracuse have done a phenomenal job. I really want to raise up uh, Bryson and Miriam for all the hard work that they've done. <laughs> Bryson and Miriam, understanding the gravity of the situation, they, were, they have sacrificed, they have now come off the payroll, and they're now going to go get secular jobs and be part-time interns. The reason they're doing that is because we cannot afford to pay all the ministry staff, and then also interns. In fact, we, we can't afford to pay a full-time ministry couple and Courtney and myself. So here's what needs to happen. We need to, as a church, faithfully and prayerfully raise our contribution about $500 a week. Now, that may seem like a lot, but if we all take it individually, I know that we can do it. And this is an opportunity we don't want to miss out on. I mean, there are a lot of people sacrificing. There are a lot of people giving a lot of money. I think we can all find it inside of our own hearts and our own selves and our finances to give a little bit more. And for those of you who are able to raise your contribution, I just ask you to please come see me so we can put together a great budget to take care of Anthony and Maria when they arrive here in a month. Amen? Amen. Now, again, this isn't about what you can't do. It's about what you can do. And a dollar, five dollars, twenty dollars, fifty dollars will go a really long way to help support their family in the full-time ministry. You know, something that, that always uh, hurts my heart is the fact that many people from other nations, and I'm just going to say a couple, but there are many, like Africans, will come to America seeking prosperity so they can go and help their people back home. People from India move over here so they can get some prosperity and help their people back home. When will us Americans have the heart to help people overseas before helping ourselves? I think it's sad and, and to our own shame that we don't have more of a heart to help people internationally. You know, truly Jesus is the savior of the world. And I'm very excited about Anthony and Maria moving here. I want to encourage all of you, start reaching out to them on Facebook, start calling them up. It's being announced today in Chicago. It's being announced also in New York City. But that's not the total plan. The Shellbracks are going to be, who are leading the church in Chicago now, they're going to be moving down to New York City, and they're going to plant the Long Island, Queens region in the New York church. Mike and Brittany Underhill are moving from New York to go lead the church in Chicago. So there's a lot of transition going on here. And trust me, to get Anthony and Maria here took a lot of prayer and took a lot of time. We fought to get them here. So when they come, let's really wrap our arms around them. This is the hope for Syracuse and the future and thus the world. Jesus is the savior of the world. Amen? Amen. You know, the, the, song, the song closes. It says, I'm on my way. I'm on my way. Home sweet home. Yeah, I'm on my way. Just set me free. Home sweet home. As we travel the road of life, remember that we are heading home. Let's hold up the standard of the Bible as we set the world free from sin. And to God be the glory.